security management. We're going to look at understanding security, information security management system, roles and responsibility, security frameworks, and human resources. So when we think about information security, we're, we're considering the idea of protecting our information against damage or danger or some sort of loss of that information. And of course, when we try to define insecurity, I mean, sometimes that is simply an emotion, perception, fear, something of the unknown, unknown situations. So we try to just evaluate, do we feel secure or do we feel insecure with our information that we are trying to protect? And when you think about different types of users, managers, different types of people, how do they view security? A viewer, a user will think of security one way, and a manager may think of it from a strictly assuming that everything is secure, and then the user may not even have a clue whether we're secure or even have a concern for whether we're secure. So, and we think, well, how much are we going to spend to feel secure? The core of information security is this triad. We have confidentiality, integrity, and availability. With confidentiality, we usually think of encryption or perhaps permissions, restricting permissions on who can access the information. Confidentiality is about making sure that the information we have is only viewable by those that should see it. If you're not, if you do not have the permissions or maybe you're a hacker or something trying to look at something you shouldn't look at, then we're with the idea if we do good security that we can keep you out of it whether it be, again, through permissions or simply we encrypted it and you don't know how to break the encryption. There's also integrity. It's not only did you see the information, but are you altering or changing the information? And if you do in an unauthorized format, it is violating integrity. Then we have availability. This is very, very important for our company as well. If, if hackers or situations are able to take the company from being up and running, to not being available to their customers, and that affects the goodwill and reputation of that company. Because the customers don't have faith that that company's got their act together, that they can keep their systems up, you know, all the time for the most part. And we, we know there's a lot of competition out there, so customers will sometimes just simply go, well, you don't have it together, you can't keep your systems up and going and available. So we will go to another, you know, go to another choice. Choose some other bank instead of your bank. For example, the role of the CSLO. CSLO stands for Certified Security Leadership Officer. The idea is to give management an essential understanding of current security of issues, best practices, and technology. This is about information security leadership. It is about governance, oversight, advice on security issues, risk management, monitoring, reporting, as well as compliance when we deal with investigations. So corporate governance. We look at the goals of the business and their objectives. It's really about the business. The business decided to be a business because they did have these objectives that they wish to accomplish. So corporate governance is a set of responsibilities and practices exercised by the board and executive management. These goals include providing strategic direction, reaching security and business objectives, ensuring that risks are managed appropriately, managed well, and verifying that the enterprise's resources are used in a responsible way. A business has a vision as well as a mission and, of course, values. A vision is what we want to be. Maybe we want to be a world leader in our particular field. Our mission is what are we, what we are, to deliver innovative solutions to our customers, might be our answer. Values are our beliefs, to honestly have honesty, integrity, good corporate citizen. Okay. We want to be all those things. So we're thinking more of what the business is after. What's our vision? What do we want to be? What are we currently? Mission. What's our mission? What we do? And of course, having some good integrity and values. So understand the business. I mean, businesses have their reason for being in business. They have different functions. They have different priorities, and of course, they have different tolerances of what type of risk they're willing to accept. So when we think of our computer security or security for the company, we have to understand and align with the goals, mission, and strategic direction of the organization. 
Sometimes computer people, IT people, simply think in the terms of it must be secure and with really no concern whether the security that we implement may, implement may be so restrictive that it impairs functionality, that it actually interferes with what we're trying to accomplish. So again, we want to make sure that we understand and align with the goals, mission, and strategic direction of the organization because that's what it is about. The organization, the business, not just the IT department. A review of governance. Information security is more than just the IT security like I was discussing with you. It's, it's not just our firewalls and our antivirus and our intrusion detection and intrusion prevention system. Information must be protected at all levels of the organization in all forms. I mean, obviously the computer part is a, is a large part of it. Understand that we have good security and, and we avoid getting viruses on our systems and backdoors and we keep the bad guys out of our systems. That's very much part of it. But it is at more than just that level. Information security is a responsibility of everyone. Sometimes users may say, well, that's not my problem. I'm just a, I'm just a user. That's your problem. But in fact, information security is a responsibility of everyone. Maybe we could say back to the user and say, well, if you know something happens and we are exploited and some, some big hacking event occurs and maybe the user saw something that they could have told us about and said, hey, something suspicious is happening, they could have helped us perhaps stop that event. And if we have a big enough security event, perhaps that would even affect the business to the point that eventually it goes out of business. And then suddenly the user is a little more interested in the security because that is their employment. So in other levels, we look at paper, fax, audio, video, microfiche, network, storage media, and computer systems. So it's not just simply the computer side of things. We have to think of all of these. Information security is rather important and we have to look at the benefits of effective information security governance such as giving us improved trust and customer relationships, protecting our organization's reputation, better accounting for safeguarding information during our critical business activities, and reduction in loss through better incident handling and disaster recovery. So really as we read through this we see that it just sounds like a company that's got their act together. I mean, customers trust us. Our, we, we tend to handle events more effectively, so our reputation tends, tends to be really good. And we're not knocked down so easily and go through great embarrassment because we were so ill-prepared. And we just essentially knowing we have you know, accountability, good auditing, we can see who's done what during our activities. And if we do have some sort of security incident or even something more severe, full-blown disaster, we actually have a plan that we practice. And, and each person knows what they're supposed to do. So we do this much faster, more effectively. First priority of the CSLO. Okay. Remember that information security is a business-driven activity. Security is here to support the interests and needs of the organization, not just the desires of security. Security is a balance between cost and benefit, security and productivity. So again, think of the business, not of just the IT department. The security is big picture. We're there to help, support, and just help this business achieve its goals. Yet we don't want to be so obsessed with security that we're so ultra strict that nothing even functions. And perhaps we don't want to come with a password policy that is so so unbelievably difficult that our users just in their wildest dreams could never memorize those passwords and maybe we've gone too far and they end up writing their passwords down, putting them on sticky notes and hiding them in, in areas near their workstation and maybe perhaps that's gone too far. We do have to meet a compromise between being, we want to be very secure, but we don't want to be so secure that we have impacted productivity in a very negative way because people can't even use the systems because they're so overly strict. Outcomes of governance. Six basic outcomes of effective security governance. We want strategic alignment, good risk management, good value delivery, manage our resources well, be able to measure our performance and of course overall integration of this. When we look at performance and governance we have to have metrics. It's only possible when metrics are in place to measure, to monitor, and to report on what we're doing and how well we're doing these, these activities. 
on whether critical organizational objectives are achieved. Are we, we have these objectives, are we actually achieving these and, and making this happen? So enterprise-wide measurement should be developed. We don't just make a plan and supposedly follow it and not really have any way of verifying that it is effective and that we are following it correctly. Organization of IT security. Manager that has primary responsibility for security would think of these things. I mean, budget, definitely. That's part of the reason we want them to be on board with many activities we do involving management is because they do okay the budget and say, yes, we can spend this much money. They have the authority. Of course, we look at education and compliance. At the same time, when we look at our reporting structure, we want to make sure that we don't have any conflicts of interest on, you know, this person reports to that person, and if there was anything fraudulent happening, we would not want it to be organized in such a way that this could be hidden, their fraudulent activities. And, of course, regular reporting goes without saying. Information security strategy. So we're developing a security strategy, and it's all about information security. And we, we are thinking of the business, and we are thinking of the long term, not just the right now. And sometimes we do get stuck, stuck in a mindset of thinking of right now, especially IT people. So IT people are always putting out fires and dealing with the, the current right now. But we also have to think of, yes, let's deal with our daily issues, but we also want to look toward the long term and what we're really trying to achieve. And we want this to be standard across the organization and always aligned with business strategy and direction. The business is the core of this. We have to understand how the organization works, and we have to think about the priorities of our business. Elements of a strategy. A security strategy needs to include the resources that we need, any sort of restriction or constraints, a roadmap, the people, the processes, the technologies that we use, and, of course, the other resources. The security architecture, defining business drivers, resource relationships, and process flow. So the whole idea is to achieve our desired state, and this would be a long-term goal of many smaller projects. So it's a series of projects to get to your eventual long-term goal. So with our information security strategy, this has to be defined. We have to have metrics again. We, if we can't measure it, it doesn't do us a very you know, good justice here. We have to be able to measure this and provides guidance as well. The goal of information security is to protect the organization's assets, the individuals, and, of course, the mission of the organization again. It's not just about IT. So with this, we have to figure out what truly are our assets. So we identify our assets. We look at the classification of data and the systems according to how critical or sensitive that information is. We could be looking at secret, top secret classifications, for example. Application of appropriate controls. So based on how critical that information is, we may have different controls. The more sensitive that information is, the more strict the controls would be. Information is an asset only to the degree it supports the primary purpose of the business. It's really all about the business and its success and its goals and you know, long-term uh, wishes and, and so on. Defining security objectives. Information security strategy forms a basis for the plans of action required to achieve those objectives. And when we think of where we want to be eventually, we call this our desired state, our long-term objectives. This should be a well-articulated vision of the desired outcomes for a security program. We want this to be clearly written, clearly spelled out. Security strategy objectives should be stated in terms of specific goals directly aimed at supporting the business again and their activities. So business linkages. So the idea here is we start with an understanding of our specific objectives of a particular line of business. And then we take in consideration all information flows and processes that are critical for us to continue our operations and enable security to be aligned with the support and support business at strategic, tactical, and operational levels. And what this means is we're trying to align our security with the business at different time periods. In other words, the daily, the midterm, and the eventual long term.
So it's not just for now and it's not just for later. It's now, midterm, and long term. Business case development. So business case for initiating a project must be captured and communicated. And things we think of as reference, context, value proposition, focus, the deliverables, any sort of dependency, dependencies that we have. And we, of course, have the metrics along the way, project metrics, the workload, what are the required resources, and any sort of commitments that we have to meet. So the business case for security must address the same criteria. Now on to the information security program. So we ask ourselves, what steps or elements are necessary to develop an effective security program? We have to really put some time into this to come to these, you know, to come up with this program. So security budget, when we look at that, we have top-down approach, bottom-up, negotiated, of course, win-win. And when discussing the security budget, it might be something coming from higher up, top down, man management moving down, or it could be something from the lower levels working back up. It could be something that we have to obviously negotiate. And we, we want the business to win and we want the, the security to win also. So I think it's a combination of having the resources at your disposal to make the company secure. The company and the managers see that they're having to put out money to make them help the business be more secure, but they need to also see that there's a great financial benefit to making their environment secure. So we end up winning on both sides. Everybody's happy in the end. Valuation. We look at a lot of costs. We look at the income cost valuation, liquidity, um, market penetration pricing, low initial value, depreciation, straight line, cost over lifespan, uh, maybe a computer for five years, accelerated, greater depreciation in the early years. So looking at our security budget and going into our security program, we have to have an idea of value, you know, what things would be worth uh, income-wise if it was liquidated. We look at depreciation and what methods we're going to use for depreciation and just basically value. Security program priorities. Again, always after high standards of corporate governance. And trade information security is a critical business issue, and sometimes it's not done that way. Many times information security is not necessarily valued as highly as it needs to be. It is very important for the survivability of a business to have good information security, so it must be treated as such. We need a security we need to create a, a security po positive environment. We need to make sure security is an integral part of our world and that people know that everyone is involved in this happening so they have the responsibilities. It's not just certain select few. So when you think about security, we want a structured deployment of risk-based controls that relate to the people, the processes, and even the technologies that we use. Everything is involved in this. This is big picture security not just technology, for example. If we don't have good security with the people, our technology controls get pushed past because maybe the people gave out their passwords and they were not really thinking that it really made that much difference. The security was not a big deal to them. So security integration. Security needs to be integrated into the business processes. It's not really an afterthought. And sometimes or many times, actually, software programming programmers have been taught to program, but not really with a security mindset. So we want to reduce the security gaps through our organizational-wide security programs because in many places there are security gaps. We want this to integrate. We want to integrate IT with the physical security is huge, risk management, privacy and compliance, and business continuity management. With security is IT, security is people, it, it deals with our risk and how well we deal with risk. And you know, physical security is something that we could get stronger with and be more restrictive on people getting into given facilities or given areas of a facility. So we start out with a theory and a concept, we call this a policy. And we can have, you know, kind of a parent policy of security, but we can also have many issue specific policies that we deal with. And these policies obviously are high level and designed to be followed. And they're interpreted through, we have procedures, baselines, and standards. 
In our environment, we want to have procedures that, step, that spell out the step-by-step -step items that we are to perform to, to basically comply with the policy. Because the policy tends to be more of a high level, and the procedures tend to be the step-by-step -step to implement those policies. And of course, we have baselines and standards. And with this, we may require that we all have Windows 7 or Windows 8 and we may require that everybody run a certain antivirus and be patched to a certain level. And maybe we have to use Microsoft Word of a certain version. And we may have these baselines and standards that must be compliant to meet our goals of the policy. And if we question whether we're actually following the policy, which was interpreted through our procedures, baselines, and standards, we could do an audit and check into this and see if people actually are doing all those things we've set forth. It has to be measurable again and auditing. We could find out if this is really happening. It's not unusual for a company to have great policies but nobody follows them. <laughs> architecture. Information security architecture is similar to physical architecture. We have to spell out the requirements. Then we have the design and the modeling. Then the creation of our blueprints and then the development, and then finally it's deployed. And architecture is planning and designing to meet the needs of the stakeholders. And we, we cannot forget that security architecture is critically important. It's one of the greatest needs for most security organ, for most organizations because security being so very important to us. So in thinking about information security framework, we have to spell out a template. We put together the structure. As been stated before, everything must be measured, and it must be where we can go back and do an audit of what has been put together to make sure it is being done properly. We have the project planning and management of this project, and then we think about their different viewpoints. We look at strategic, tactical, and operational viewpoints, and what that really means is long-term, our long-term goals, our mid-term goals, and then our daily kind of operational goals are, are different perspectives from the long term, the mid term, and of course the short term. So with a security framework, this defines our information security goals or objectives. We make sure that it aligns with the objectives of the business. We want to make sure we have some sort of metrics to measure the compliance and the trends. And also we want to standardize our security activities throughout the entire enterprise. We don't want part of the enterprise to be doing one thing security-wise and another part of the enterprise to be doing something completely different. So looking at the desired state of our security, we must be defined in terms of attributes, characteristics, and outcomes. And this does, does need to be clear to all the stakeholders what we're trying to accomplish, what our intended security state should be. Then we look at the using the balanced scoreboard, scorecard, the four perspectives a balanced scorecard. And it is really a balance when you think about it. I mean, we, we want good security, but of course we have to look at all these things. We have to think about the financial side. That cannot be ignored. There's the customer perspective, the vision and strategy that we're, we're working toward, the internal business processes, and of course it's going to be a learning process. It's not like we just, you know, flip a switch and suddenly we've got our act all together. It's going to take some time. So there is learning and growth. Key factors. We absolutely need senior management support. Uh, many books out there on security discuss this and mention without senior management support, whatever our plan is, whatever our agenda is, is likely to fail. So it's very critical that we have their support. Obviously, that support will translate into support throughout the whole organization, from kind of a top-down approach. Plus, they do provide the financial side of this as well, the approval for the financial. So that's a critical part. We do always need to align with the security framework and, of course, have good program management. Now, senior management, again, their support, they want it, we want them deeply involved in part of this. That's why we see so much of consult senior management. They're ultimately accountable. I mean, whatever we do affects them. And we need them to be completely aware of what we're doing and on board with what we're doing. 
because their support is involved in, of course, the policy, the budget, absolutely, getting the resources that we need, and, of course, the authority to do what we're trying to accomplish. We ask ourselves how a certified security leadership officer can gain and maintain support from other senior managers. And we look at how we need to make sure that we communicate with them and how we're going to align the business mission and its goals with the idea of trying to make sure we have a really good secure environment. Now we can align with different security frameworks as listed here. ISO 27001. It's a family of standards that help an organization keep information assets secure. And using the family standards can help your organization manage the security of assets such as financial information, intellectual property, employee details, and information entrusted to your company by third parties. With the ISO 27001, we're looking at information technology, security techniques, information security management system. With this, it formally specifies an information security management system, a suite of activities concerning the management of information security risk. This information security management system is basically an overarching management framework through which the organization identifies, analyzes, and addresses its information security risk. With the ISO 27002, this standard establishes guidelines and general principles for initiating, implementing, and maintaining and improving security management within the organization. The actual controls listed in the standard are intended to address the specific requirements identified through a formal risk amount assessment. The standard is also intended to provide a guide for the development of an organizational security standards and effective security management practices and to help build confidence in your different organizational activities. We also have COBIT, which stands for Control Objectives for Information and Related Technology. It's a framework created by ASACA for Information Technology Management and IT Governance. It's a supporting tool set that allows managers to bridge the gap between control requirements, technical issues, and business risk. Then there's ITIL. This was formerly known as Information Technology Infrastructure Library, but basically it's a set of practices for IT service management, ITSM, that focuses on aligning IT services with the needs of the business. Then we have SABSA, proven methodology for developing business-driven, risk and opportunity-focused security architectures at both enterprise and solutions level that traceably support business objectives. It's also widely used for information assurance architecture, risk management frameworks, and to align and, and seamlessly integrate security and risk management into an IT architecture methods and frameworks. With the ISO IEC 27001, basically this is an information security management system as we're prepared to provide a model for establishing, implementing, maintaining, and continually improving an information security management system within your particular organization. And we look at the integration of this information security management system. This must be part of and integrated with your organization's processes and the overall management structure. The information security is considered in the design of processes, information systems, and control controls. And so, in other words, we need to Think about information security throughout the entire process. It's not just an afterthought. Suitability for organizations of all sizes. Information security management systems implementation must be skilled in accordance to the need of your organization. Your organization might be a 10-person office or it could be you know, a 10,000-person organization. And we have to adapt based on those needs and the sizes, of course. COBIT 4.1. So looking at the process areas of COBIT. And again, control objectives for information and related technology. We're looking at strategic alignment, value, good delivery, good value, resource management, risk management. We cannot leave out risk management and measuring performance and making sure we are compliant. COBIT has several phases here. We have plan and organize providing the direction to solution delivery, 
We have the acquire and implement, provides the solutions and passes them to be turned into services, deliver and support, receive these solutions and make them usable for the end users, and monitor and evaluate. Monitors all processes to ensure that the direction provided is actually followed. Now, deeming and basically looking at the quality, deeming and quality, out of crisis. This book by W. Edwards Deming, Out of the Crisis, made the, the 21 most influential business management books. According to W. Edwards Deming, American companies require nothing less than a transformation of management style and of the government relations with industry. This book was originally published back in 1982. He offered a theory of management based on his famous 14 points failure to plan for the future. He claims brings a loss of market, which brings a loss of jobs. So really what it just kind of comes down to, he explains the principles of management transformation and how to apply them. So here's this book. It could be a really interesting read. So essentially all about quality at a reasonable cost, process improvement, and of course it's 14 points that I mentioned. Now on to ethics and human resources management. Seven signs of ethical collapse. Pressure to maintain numbers, fear and silence. Young uns and a bigger than life CEO. Weak board of directors, conflicts of interest, overlooked or unaddressed. Innovation like no other company. Goodness in some areas atones for evils in others. So we could see various signs of, of ethical collapse in numerous companies if we really, really looked at them. If you're wanting to know more about these ethical issues, you can Google the seven signs of ethical collapse. And there's various websites that come up, such as this one, um, How to Spot moral meltdowns before it's too late, late focus on ethical culture, and this goes through kind of a summary of the points that were just made in our coursework. Pressure to maintain the numbers, fear and silence, youngins and bigger than life CEO, weak board, conflicts, cultural conflicts, and so on. And there's also even more reading, there's, there's a book on it, The Seven Signs of Ethical Collapse, Marianne Dem Jennings. So for companies to survive well, we cannot neglect looking at these areas uh, of ethical collapse as part of an, an issue in our company. Fraud, another big area. Manager's responsibility. It seems like everything goes back to management, especially upper management. And maybe it is because you know we have these things happening here, lack of enforcement of internal controls. Expense reports, cash, customer accounting. I mean, this is all management's responsibility. If it's not done well, there could be fraud happening in a company. We may not even realize it. And again, we've seen in numerous courses, separation of duties where a person has the ability to do one task and they don't need the ability to do another task at the same time because they would end up having too much power. Job rotation is important too when you are trying to fight fraud because the idea is a person works in one position then moves to another job position and so on and then anyone that moves into your position if you've been doing something fraudulent that may come up they may notice the fraudulent behavior some evidence on the computer and of course when you move into another position you may also discover something fraudulent that's been going on. Looking at good to great Level 5 leadership. Leaders who are humble but driven to do what's best for the company. That would be really great. First who, then what. Get the right people on the bus, then figure out where to go. Finding the right people and trying them out in different positions, seeing what they're good at. But The idea is starting with the right people, not the wrong people. Confront the brutal facts. The Stockdale Paradox. Confront the brutal truth of the situation, yet at the same time, never give up hope. Still going good to great. Hedgehog concept. Three overlapping circles. What lights your fire? Passion. What could be best in the world at? The best at? What I'm best at? What makes you money? Your driving resource. That drives a lot of people, actually. 
And by looking at these different areas, I mean, what really gets you going? What are you really passionate about? What are you really good at? And, of course, the fact that we like money and that that's really a driving resource. This is really a hedgehog concept. Culture of discipline, rinsing the cottage cheese. With rinsing the cottage cheese, the idea, if diligent attention to detail is essential, you have to decide what's important and what is trivial. We also look at technology accelerators using technology to accelerate growth within the three circles of the hedgehog concept. And when we think about technology, I mean, that's a really big driving force in our companies these days. It's hard to imagine doing what we do without having technology. The flywheel, the additive effect of many small initiatives, they act on each other like compound interest. The idea behind this is to know, you know, kind of a play on words with flywheel, and know when it's time to change the direction of the flywheel. You want to apply the flywheel concept to your own life and career potentially. Seven habits of highly effective people. Independence. Habit one, be proactive, take the initiative, not reactive, proactive. Habit two, begin with the end in mind. Clarify your character values and your life goals. Know what your goals are. Habit three, put first things first. Working with others. Habit four, think when, when. Habit five, seek first to understand, then be understood. Habit six, synergize. Combine the strengths of people through positive teamwork. Continuous improvements. The final habit is that of continuous improvement in both the personal and the interpersonal spheres of influence. Habit seven, sharpen the saw. Here's the book. We have the seven habits of highly effective people, powerful lessons in personal change, which has proven principles of fairness, integrity, honesty, and human dignity. Hiring and employment. We want qualified staff. And if we hire somebody, we want to make sure that we have done a background check on them. Uh, it may be something as simple as verifying their job experience, ver verifying that they did actually go to Harvard if they claim they did. Of course, looking at non-disclosure agreements and tax information potentially, W-9s, 1099s. We also have interviews, demonstrate knowledge. We may want them to show us samples of their work to get an idea that they're not just the talk, that they actually have done these things that you talk about, and just show us you know, proof of that. With employment, we also have a development plan, training. The people We may have good people that we've hired, but they may not necessarily have the skills that they need for the particular application we need them to do. So their employee training is always a big part of it. And, of course, removal of access on departure, not unusual. If someone is leaving your company, you want to make sure that you remove any sort of access or equipment or anything they have to get into your systems because we don't want any sort of disgruntled employee when, when they leave the company. Business and global marketing. We think of the culture, greetings and human interactions, business cards, shaking hands. We see it all around us. We see... Uh, of course, the language we use, making sure it's appropriate for the business application. And, of course, when we look at different countries, there may be different ways of doing human interaction where maybe shaking the hands in the United States is okay and acceptable, yet it may not be okay in some other countries. Now, looking at the saving face, saving face signifies a desire or defines a strategy to avoid humiliation or embarrassment to maintain dignity or preserve your reputation. Eleanor Roosevelt's familiar quote, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent, is an extension of the theme of saving face. When we look at marketing, there's the four P's of marketing. We look at the price, the product, promotion, and position. With the four P's of marketing, again, we look at price and the product and promotion and position. With price, we think to ourselves, what is the value of the product or service to the buyer? Are there any established price points for products or services? Is the customer price sensitive? What discount should be offered? How will the price compare with our competitors? Then we also look at the product. 
what does a customer want from the product or service? What do we need? What needs do we need to satisfy? What features does it have to meet these needs? How and where will the customer use it? What does it look like? What sizes, colors, and so on? What will it be called? How will it be branded? How will it be differentiated uh, versus you know, from you know competition? Things like that. Promotion. Where and when can you get across your marketing message to your target? Will you reach your audience by advertising in the press or on TV or radio or maybe in billboards? What's the best time to promote this? How does your competition do their promotions? There may even be a value added tax also or maybe called goods on services tax, a form of a consumption tax. From that of the seller, it's a tax only on the value added to the product, material or service. From an accounting point of view, by this stage or manufacturer or distribution. With negotiating, we have BATNA, Integrated Bargaining, and SOPA. With BATNA, essentially best alternative to negotiated agreement. You have more than one possible solution if this involves planning preparations and alternatives. This term was coined by Roger Fisher and William Urey in the 1981 bestseller Getting to Yes, Negotiating Without Giving In. Stands for Best Alternative to a Negotiated Agreement. It's the best you can do if the other person refuses to negotiate with you. So it's not necessarily your ideal outcome, unless your ideal outcome is something you can get without the cooperation of the other person. It's really just the best you can do without them. Integrative bargaining, win-win, mutual gains. Win-win outcomes occur when each side of a dispute feel that they have won. Since both sides benefit from such a scenario, any resolution to that conflict is likely to be accepted voluntarily. The process of integrated bargaining aims to achieve this through cooperation, win-win outcomes. With mutual gains approach, it's basically still negotiation based on experimental findings and hundreds of real-world cases, lays out four steps for negotiating better outcomes while protecting the relationships and reputation. The central tenet of the model and the robust theory that underlies this as the vast majority of negotiations in the real world involve parties who have more than one goal or concern in mind and more than one issue that can be addressed in the agreement they reach. The model allows parties to improve their chances of creating an agreement superior to the existing alternatives. ZOPA, Zone of Possible Agreement. The Zone of Possible Agreement, also called the Bargaining Range, exists if there's a potential agreement that would benefit both sides more than their alternative options do. So if you had Bob that wanted to buy an item for 5000 or less and Sue wants to buy to sell the item for 4500 those two persons have a ZOPA. They have a zone of possible agreement. But essentially if the one will not go below a certain price and the other one will not go above a certain price, then you do not have the zone of possible agreement. So this is a bargaining range and it's critical to the success of your negotiation. Finding the zone of possible agreement can be challenging though. Trade secrets, patents, copyrights, and trademarks are all part of intellectual property. When you think of trade secrets, by definition, this is information including a formula, pattern, compilation, program, device, method, technique, or process that derives independent economic value, actual or potential, from not being generally known to or readily ascertainable through appropriate means by other persons who might obtain economic value from its disclosure or use, and is the subject of efforts that are reasonable under the circumstances to maintain its secrecy. Then there's patents by definition as well, the exclusive right granted by a government to an inventor to manufacture, use, or sell an invention for a certain number of years. An invention or process protected by this right. Copyright, a legal right created by the law of a country that grants the creator of an original work exclusive rights to its use and distribution, usually for a limited time. With the intention of enabling the creator, could be a photographer of a photograph or the author of a book, to receive basically money, compensation for their intellectual effort. With fair use, 
Fair use is a limitation and exception to the exclusive right granted by a copyright law to the author of a creative work. In the U.S. copyright law, fair use is a doctrine that permits limited use of, a, of copyrighted material without acquiring permission from the, the rights holders. Examples could be a fair use to include it in commentary, search engines, criticism, parody, news reporting, research, teaching, library archiving, and scholarship. Trademarks. A trademark is a recognizable sign, design, or expression which identifies products or services of a particular source from those of others. A trademark could be located on a package or a label, and when it comes to corporate identities, it may be displayed on the actual building. Relating to trademarks, there's goodwill. Goodwill has been defined as the benefit and advantage of the good name, reputation, and connection of a business, the attractive force which brings in customers. In many cases, goodwill can be used interchangeably with the word reputation. Protecting intellectual property. First, we have the non-disclosure agreements. A non-disclosure agreement, also sometimes called a confidentiality agreement, confidentiality disclosure agreement, and so on, it's a legal contract between at least two parties that outlines the confidential material, knowledge, or information that the parties wish to share with one another for certain purposes, but wish to restrict access to, to other people, you know, outside of these two that have made this agreement. And this contract through which parties agree not to disclose information covered by that agreement. Then we have the non-compete non-compete clause, which one party usually employee agrees not to enter into or start a similar profession or trade in competition against another party, which is typically the employer. There also needs to be control over publicly released information. We have to watch what is actually released into the public, some of it being quite sensitive if we're not careful. Then there's labels and watermarks. A watermark is an identifying image or pattern in paper it appears as various shades of whiteness and darkness when viewed by transmitted light or reflected light caused by thickness or density variations in the paper. We see these on postage stamps, currencies, and other government documents to discourage counterfeiting. We also have to monitor what traffic goes out of our company. We call this data loss or data leakage prevention. It's a strategy for making sure that end users do not send out sensitive or critical information outside of the corporate network. It's also to describe software products that help a network administrator control what data end users can transfer. DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. To create an updated version of the copyright laws to deal with the special challenges of regulating digital material. The idea was to protect rights of both copyright owners and consumers. More attacks on intellectual property. We have cyber squatting. With cyber squatting, we're registering, selling, or using a domain name with the intent of profiting from the goodwill of someone else's trademark. Generally refers to the practice of buying up a domain names that use the names of existing businesses with the intent to sell the name for a profit to those businesses. We also have insider threats, and essentially these are people inside of a company that are willing to commit crime, maybe with the idea of being paid off for giving out that inside information, or maybe they want to cause harm to their own company because they're not very happy employees or some sort of bad will toward the company. Then we think about steganography. I mean, it's all about hiding the information. There could be some information is very important to the company that is being hidden in another form. With steganography, it's, it was really all about the art and science of hiding information. And it may be using uh, graphics, sound, text, and then hiding something else inside of that. And there's plenty of software out there that will do this for you. An example here, we have a steganography tool here, Quick Stego. And the thinking on this is you see you have this tool set and it has a capability of hiding text, perhaps in an image. Here's another one, Camera Shy. Camera Shy is an old tool that we can take and put a password protection on it, pick out a picture, for example, type in our hidden message, hit the little gold lock picture, lock the message, could be secret plans for our company inside of the picture. 
and then send that picture, which looks for the most part pretty harmless unless someone has some sort of steg stego steganography detection type tools, which they do exist. Encryption is all around us. Our companies may be using encryption to encrypt hard disk on laptops that our employees travel with, and that would help keep our information protected. We may have encryption through our virtual private networks. Privacy and awareness. OECD Privacy Principles, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Privacy frameworks may be used as tools to help us think about and frame discussions about privacy and understand our privacy requirements. Internationally, the OECD Privacy Principles provide the most commonly used privacy framework. They're reflected in existing and emergency privacy, emerging privacy and data protection laws. And they serve as a basis for the creation of leading practice privacy programs and additional principles. And they break down into numerous principles that we're going to look at. Collection limitation principle. There should be limits to the collection of personal data, and any such data should be obtained by lawful and fair means, and where appropriate, with the knowledge and consent of the data subject. Then we have the data quality principle. Personal data should be relevant to the purpose for which they're to be used, and to the extent necessary for those purposes. It should be accurate, complete, and kept up to date. Then there's the purpose specification principle. The purposes for which personal data are collected should be specified not later than at the time of data collection and the subsequent use limited to the fulfillment of those purposes and such others as are not incompatible with those purposes and as are specified in each occasion of change or purpose. Then there is the use limitation principle. Personal data should not be disclosed, made available, or otherwise used for purposes other than those specified in accordance with, except with the consent of the data subject or by the authority of law. Security safeguards principle. Personal data should be protected by reasonable security safeguards against such risk as loss or unauthorized access, destruction, use, modification, or disclosure of data. Openness principle. There should be a general policy of openness about developments, practices, and policies with respect to personal data. Means should be readily available of establishing the existence and nature of personal data and the main purposes of their use, as well as their identity and usual residence of the data controller. We also have individual participation principle. Individuals should have the right to obtain from the data controller or otherwise confirmation of whether or not the data controller has data relating to that person. Also, to have communicated to this person data relating to him or her within a reasonable time at a charge, if any, is not excessive in a reasonable manner, in a form that's really intelligible to him, basically readable. Also, to be given reasons if a request made under this, and be able to challenge such denial if they say, no, you can't have this information, and to challenge the data relating to this person, him or her. If there is a challenge, it's successful to have the data erased, rectified, completed, or amended. Then there's the accountability principle, and this is where the data controller should be accountable for complying with these principles set forth. First, we have PII and PHI, personally identifiable information. Now, personally identifiable information is any data that could be potentially identify a specific individual, can be used to distinguish one person from another, and can be used to essentially make yourself more known. So yes, this is something that uniquely identifies that person. There is NIST Special Publication SP 800-122. This publication provides guidelines for a risk-based approach to protecting the confidentiality of the personal identifiable information, PII. Provides practical content-based guidance for identifying your PII and determining what level of protection would be appropriate for each instance of your personally identifiable information. It also suggests safeguards that may offer appropriate levels of protection for your PII. 
and provides recommendations for developing response plans when there's a breach of your information. Then there's also personal health information, PHI. This is basically protected health information, generally refers to demographic information, medical history, test and laboratory results, insurance information, and other data that's collected by a healthcare professional to identify an individual and determine what type of care that individual should receive. Awareness Training, NIST Special Publication 800-50, Building an Information Technology Security Awareness and Training Program, providing guidance for building an effective information technology security program and supporting requirements specified by FISMA and Office of Management and Budget Circular. When we look at awareness training, we have to structure an agency awareness and training program. We have to look at the needs of the organization, a needs assessment. We have to develop an awareness and training strategy and plan, figure out our priorities, set our bar, and fund the security awareness and training program. Purpose of awareness training. We want to change the behaviors of our, of our personnel. And we also want to act responsibly. We want to do our due diligence and our due care. Due diligence. When we think of due diligence, it could be an investigation of a business or a person prior to signing a contract. You could think of this as a voluntary investigation. You could also think of it as looking into something in order to eventually satisfy due care. You do your investigation. Maybe it's a company that wants to make sure that they, they want to see what their weaknesses are. So they do some sort of a vulnerability assessment or penetration testing and they look into what their weaknesses are and maybe they discover that there's a lot of weaknesses and then they, they look at the recommendations that they were given to fix these weaknesses to deal with that and they could exercise due care by perhaps taking an action and installing the firewalls that maybe were recommended or the various security products that were recommended after vulnerability assessment penetration testing was done so they're acting responsibly. Another definition, uh, conduct, due care, conduct that a reasonable person would exercise in a particular situation, looking out for the safety of others. You want to show that you are not negligent. So we see companies exercise due care by taking some sort of action to basically look out for the safety of others, for example. We want to avoid liability by acting responsibly. We had hoped to avoid being liable. We had hoped to show we were responsible for something, that we acted properly. We exercised reasonable care to do the best we could to protect others from harm. We have to evaluate the cost and the benefit of this, of course. In summary, an information security program must be aligned with the goals and the mission of the organization. Information security should be integrated into everything that you do as a business, all your processes, not an afterthought, but an integral part.